Morning, church. Hey, let's give it up for God and uh, him making himself known through this band. Powerful. Very powerful. We stand to honor God and his word because we see it through the times of Josiah. When the scriptures were lost, they were recovered, and King Josiah read the scriptures to all of his people, all of Israel, and they all were astonished with what they heard. May that be true this morning. May we not grow old and weary and this be tiresome news that we read through the scriptures, but we do this to honor God, at least in our physical posture. With that being said, as I read the scriptures, if there's something that stirs within you an amen and an agreement, feel free where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom to vocalize that this morning. All you're doing is just agreeing with heaven, amen? Amen. Let's get into the text. The apostle Paul writing here, he says, when I think of all of this. I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me, how's it going, Mike? Assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. As you read what I have written you, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to this previous generation but by now his spirit has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally, equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Father, I thank you no matter how different our backgrounds are at CLB, the complexion of our skin, the culture that we've inherited from our parents, certain family and generational habits, God, that we have all inherited your spiritual blessing. Amen. God, would you teach us of what that looks like to have a kingdom culture in our hearts yes, and a biblical worldview to honor you in every facet of our life. Yes, both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. Yes. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all of God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. God, thank you for the endless treasures available to you. All the adventure that we seek, God, is found in you. Yes, sir. Everything begins and ends with a trust in you, creator and finisher and sustainer of our faith. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church. Everyone say church. Church. To display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly place. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord, because of Christ and our faith in him. We can now boldly, not timidly, boldly and confidently enter into God's presence. Let's pray. God, because of your sacrifice, we boldly enter into your presence in prayer. Build up your church this morning, God, that we would become that much more aware of your presence, Holy Spirit, and we would boldly approach your your throne, God. Give us a desire, an increase, God, an increased desire to connect with you and commune with you. God, help me get out of the way as a herald of yours. Help the listener get out of the way, God. We desire to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Go ahead and take a seat, y'all. This morning's text, Paul gives us one secret that we already read through, and then he gives the one purpose of that secret. And it's, it's something that's very familiar to us in terms of the plan of God, the secret that's revealed. But the purpose is something that may be unfamiliar to us especially if we haven't been within the church, or it may be very different to us compared to how we were discipled growing up, what type of denomination, what type of field of a church we were a part of. So that's what we're going to get into through the text. That's how he guides. Ephesians 2, verse 3, the Apostle Paul writing to the Ephesian church here, and he says, in, and he says as I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. In Acts chapter 26, it chronicles how the Apostle Paul goes to King Agrippa, and he testifies, hey, do you know of this Jesus? He's given me a secret. And then later on, he ends up saying, I have dedicated my life to revealing this secret to the Gentiles. 
And so as you're reading as a first generational reader, as the original readers, you think to yourself, oh my goodness, what is this secret that Paul has? If you're a Jew growing up, you're thinking, okay, all of Yahweh, all that Yahweh knows has been revealed to us. What else can be revealed to us? And the apostle Paul says, here, come here. There's this mysterious plan, came from God himself, and they got a secret to tell you. He wants the original reader to be on the edge of their seats with a listening ear. Verse 4, as you read what I have written you, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now his spirit, but now by his spirit, he's revealed it to the holy apostles and prophets. Paul's building anticipation. He's saying, all that you have known, all that you have known is really not complete in knowledge yet. But by the apostles, meaning himself and the prophets, the Holy Spirit's revealed one secret that he hasn't told to any other generations. And then he moves on. For those of us who enjoy getting the scuttlebutt, this would have been difficult to read. But as the original reader, I could imagine them being like, what is this? What is this? He could have immediately said, hey, here's the secret. Here's the purpose of it. But he wants the listener to get that much more into the text. And in verse 6, we end up reading, and this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews, Gentiles meaning those who are not Jewish, Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promised blessings because they belong to Christ. Not because we are such good moral people, but because of Christ's merit. You track with me, church? We belong to Christ. If you were to look at your apparel right now, you will see that the shirt belonged to someone that designed it. In a similar way as image bearers, when we get born again and surrender our lives to Christ, we then end up putting these unseen robes and shirts on. And, we're, and it says, by Christ, in Christ, new creation. Amen? Amen. It's all, we inherit all this because we belong to Christ. God's mysterious plan was to make both believing Gentiles and believing Jews a part of his family where before the church, it was the believing Jews and a few of the believing Gentiles. They would no longer be seen, these Gentiles, by God as two different people groups, but as one people group coming together, that they would become of the same body and inherit the same blessings. If you're not moved by this, neither was I when I read it. And I'm the one who's teaching on it. I'm the one who was meditating on it, on the depths of its wisdom and what it really means for our souls. And I think it was a co- because of a couple of reasons. Maybe you, I'll share them with you and you would share them with me. The first one is sometimes it's just old news to end up hearing, okay, the Jews, the Gentiles became one body. It's a mystery in Christ. Okay, get it. And that becomes old news. So when you read it, you just kind of gloss over it, pass over it. Your heart's not moved by it. No one will admit that with an amen. Perfectly fine. <laughs> the second one is maybe it's that we have not yet read this text as a first generational Jew of the first century. Because if we would, we would end up feeling a little bit more of just how powerful this message is. So if we were first century Jew, all we would have known are the Hebrew scriptures, the old covenant scriptures. And so if we were to read Paul, we we would be absolutely shocked. Why? We already knew a first generational Jew, an early Jew, knew that salvation was coming to the Gentiles. That's already, you can see the slides up here. There are slides up here that will, that will show just a small portion. If you were Jewish, you read this in the first century, you're like, okay, we already know that the Jews are going to come to salvation, right? Abraham's going to go to the nations and Israel will be a blessing. But the mystery for the Jews that was revealed was not just that. It was that Yahweh would bring salvation to the Gentiles while keeping them a Gentile mind blown for me but we experience it all the time it's not gentile and jew nowadays it's the fact that when i got born again and you got born again i didn't just become a different ethnicity (laughs) i didn't just inherit a totally different culture i didn't overlook my identities in other ways but as you read your bible he conforms you into his image and your kingdom identity becomes number one it was a beautiful thing you can't find a verse in the old covenant scriptures that would reveal to the jews that the Gentiles would remain Gentile and get saved. If you would have asked a first century Jew during that time, hey, does Yahweh care to save Gentiles? He would say, yes, absolutely. And here's how it would happen. They would have to eat kosher. They would come under the Mosaic law. They would end up having to get snipped. 
All the, they, would have to, they would have to be Jewish, in other words, and then they could be saved. But instead, Paul reveals this secret. And to a first century Jew, it's like, he no longer requires that. For us, again, it's works and it's grace in our context. It's the fact that you can't be a good enough person, but that Christ is perfect. And that when you ex exercise faith, he sees you and you're made right with him because of his sacrifice. Amen? Amen. It's a beautiful image. So God made one new creation and he made us right by it. Ephesians 2 ends up testifying to this. He writes earlier, he made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people group from two people groups. So in the early church writings, you could find them, the, the Jewish, Christ, Jewish Christians or just Christians, Gentile Christians, write and refer to themselves as people of the way or the third people group. And sometimes the third race. That's just a refreshing perspective. If you, it places such a priority in a culture and in a dynamic where you grow up, you identify. Politics right now, you identify. Think this way, I think that way, so boom, I'm going to get into that category. I'm made this way, I look this way, boom, I don't want to be called a certain thing by this community, so I'm going to enter into it and I'm going to end up con conforming to it. It's this beautiful picture. God's like, you are third race. You're not Gentile, you're not Jew, you're not Tongan primarily, you're not white primarily. And by the way, like white people, it's just like, you're not Italian, you're not, I mean, Irish, it's just like a mix of things. So it's not like Europe where you're like, Irish pride. Anyways, that's an aside, I just, it's fascinating to me. We're a third race, a people set apart, a people of priests called to a greater kingdom perspective, a refreshing respect, a perspective, calling them the third race prioritizes the kingdom of God and what he says to you and about your identity and how to view everything in society, education, politics, whatever else, it has to come through this. It has to come through the scriptures. And yes, there are some both ands in here, but there are some topics that, that are not debatable. There are some things that God says are right and some things that God says are wrong. And we say, listen, I know I was taught this growing up. I grew up in a family that literally taught me that anything goes. It's subjective, true subjective. And then you end up getting born again. You're like, third race, this right here. God's sacrifice. Each one who's born again, we're looking at this like, God, tell us what to do. Like, Papa, speak to me. Remind me of who I am. Give me wisdom on how to see culture. Give me wisdom. Give me the spirit of discernment. And I, I just suspect, looking at Acts 2, when there was persecution, secular history shows the writer Josephus, Jewish guy, he ends up saying that in 80 AD, 90 AD, the persecution from Rome to the Jewish church, the people of God, was so terrible that it painted the streets in Rome with blood. And that Nero would literally, write, literally uh, crucify born-again people, light them on fire, on his front lawn, like lampposts. And then you read of Acts 2, which happened a little bit earlier, and you saw that the church was sharing things. They were just one people group, and persecution came. I can't help but imagine that they thought to themselves, and they really got it, like they really got it. You know what I'm saying? They really got that they were the third ethnic group. They were the third race. Like they really believed it in their heart because they were pressed and crushed, but yet they were never abandoned by God. Ephesians 3, verse 6 reads, it's all through Christ. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promised blessings of God all through Christ. We wouldn't be a church, a people called to be set apart if it was through anything else. If it was through genetic ancestry, it was through your Bible knowledge, if it was through Awanas, if it was through the moral law, the traditions of man, none of that would have worked. And I know it's old news sometimes, but there are some things in our life that just end up coming back to the surface that remind us that we need to kill that mentality. It's all through grace because of Jesus. And check out with me. Listen, that, that's all news that we're familiar with. What's fascinating is what's coming up next. He gives us the purpose of this secret being revealed. And I'm like, oh, Lord, get us ready. Get us ready right now. Ten. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom. You being the third people group, 
you being called to be set apart, us being spiritual siblings, was for us to display his wisdom in its rich, rich variety. Check this, though. To the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. It was not for us to display God's wisdom to the lost. Although that's true, but in this text, like a diamond, he's focusing in. It's on the unseen realm that you and I would end up displaying God's wisdom. And it's not just take us back out of, out of Ephesians. You end up seeing multiple scriptures say that it's the angelic, right? It's, let's just say, the heavenly hosts, the good guys in the unseen realm, but it's also the bad guys. You see, in chapter 6, we know that in this specific verse, I'm sorry, yeah, chapter 6, moving forward, he refers to the unseen rulers and authorities in the context of the dominion of darkness and evil. And so the unseen rulers and the authorities are evil spirits that rule over cities, counties, regions, and countries, and people groups. Dr. Tim Mackey of the Bible Project, he describes that these rulers, these evil, I'm just going to say rulers because it wears me out to always throw an adjective, evil. These unseen rulers, these rulers, they are over leadership and influence power, sex, money. If you look at specific people groups, if you look at America and the certain generational sins in the past, let's just say since 1970s that we've seen, it's been a ruler overseeing and promoting through leadership, government leadership and influencers, sin. So unseen rulers are in the dominion of darkness and in the kingdom of light. There are rankings to all of these hosts. So in the dominion of darkness, we have personal demonic spirits that are unclean. There you see the ones in the gospels that are cast out. Okay, those are different and in lower tier than the power of these rulers and these authorities in the unseen realm. The prophets of old, we just don't make this stuff up. The prophets of old, they looked at the evil empires of the day and they saw two dimensions. The first one was the ruler and the second one was an unseen ruler who was influencing their decision making. An example of this is in Genesis 12 verse 12. We find out that the spiritual rulers, right, who are evil, are influencing Pharaoh's edict to kill every Jewish boy, baby that was born a boy. Throw them into the river, he ends up telling the midwives. And it's not explicit in the text, but you end up seeing later on, we get more commentary. Here's where it's said, here is where it is said, and then recognize that the gods of Egypt were behind this. On that night, I will pass through the land, God talking here, of Egypt, and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male in the land of Egypt, I will execute my judgment against all the gods of Egypt. So what were the origins of these unseen rulers? The unseen rulers and authorities were faithful servants in the divine counsel of God. Okay, now we're going into like, hey, if we ever thought we were Western, we're gonna, we didn't think we were Western, we're going to really recognize it right now. You see, God set up his rule in partnership. There's a trinity and also... There's God's staff team in ruling the universe. And that's his divine counsel, his created beings. And in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel, both humanity and some of the divine counsel ended up rebelling against God. And this isn't explicit in Genesis 11, but if you look up here in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, they end up alluding to what was happening in the unseen realm. And that's where we end up seeing this happen. And as a consequence for the rebellion, Yahweh then at the Tower of Babel scatters all of humanity. And simultaneously, he ends up kicking out the divine council who rebelled against them. So those are the rulers right now. And he ends up scattering them over all of the people groups of the world. Look at me, look at with me at uh, Deuteronomy 32. This is where we get it. When the Most High assigned lands to the nations, when he divided up the human race, he established the boundaries of the peoples according to the number in the heavenly court. It was an indictment on humanity, and it was an indictment on rebellious divine counsel. He said genuinely to the humans, okay, you don't want me to rule your life? Well, now I'm going to place created beings to rule over you. You don't get my blessing. Boom, you're scattered. 
And then it was an indictment on the divine council. Oh, you don't want to oversee and influence all of the universe while partnering with me, divine council? Boom, you're kicked out, and now you're going to influence a small group of people. All demotions, all basically casting out people and being like, listen, you don't understand. Yahweh was saying, how blessed you are in my presence. How blessed humanity and the divine council are to partner with him. Have you ever thought you, were, you didn't think you were Western? I thought so when I started studying this stuff. The unseen rulers are still today influencing governments, people groups, areas, cities. An example of this, people talk about it in different languages and depending on how you grew up and how it's referred to. Essentially, this is what happens. We moved from D.C. in 2015 to Bay Area, California. And it was so evident that the people there hated God to the point where there was criticism and atheism was celebrated. So in other words, like atheism and disbelief in God was the, the false idol that that ruler of the area was promoting in life. So much so that you would walk out, you, it didn't matter if you studied the word of God and you witnessed to someone, you were literally looked at as a buffoon and not intellectual if you believe that there was a God, not even Jesus, but a God, okay? And then you end up coming here, sorry, my family ends up moving here in 2017. That's almost non-existent. I'll say, I say almost non-existent. What was evident to us was dead religion. And that is an example of the ruler of different areas and the specific sins that are promoted at a higher level. So you're asking, what does this all mean? We'll get to it. What's so interesting is that, if, is that Paul ends up saying that the purpose of the church is to display God's wisdom to these unseen rulers and authorities. We get lessons because it's there in the scriptures how to live out a life that would end up promoting godliness or draw lost people in. And in this text he's saying, you're going to witness to the dominion of darkness. It's like, what? <laughs> what does that even look like? Mind-blowing, how many churches, though, actually come out with that statement? Like, no, I've never seen a church website yet come out and say, this is our mission statement. We exist to display God's wisdom to the devils. That, no church growth. Like, that's not a promoter of church growth. That's not going to stimulate the lost to come. We are not teaching city like kids. Hey, guys, we exist to display God's wisdom to the dominion of darkness. Let's pray out. None of you went to vacation, Bible school, checked in your kids, and that's what's actually being taught to them. But before we end up casting aside that maybe this is over the top, we have to consider the source. This is the Apostle Paul, y'all. Like, you can't categorize him in this, what I think is also a false category and saying, you know what? He's emotionally driven. That guy doesn't know the scriptures. He's Jew. Like, whatever it is, we can't, we can't put that on him. Because his reputation is one of an intellectual giant. He also knew the spirit of God that controlled him and was emotionally connected to the unseen. He called himself the Pharisee of Hebrew scripture. He was the Berean of all Bereans, promoting the church to search the scriptures and test to see if his testimony was true. He argued with Greek philosophers, and to this day, in law schools, the book of Romans that he wrote is used to teach um, lawyers on how to argue. Like that's how reasonable the Apostle Paul is. And he's the one, he's the one, not Roy. He's the one who's telling us as a church that a part of our purpose is to display the wisdom of God to the dominion of darkness. So what does this tell us? What are we getting at? That there is much, 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 much more than that catches the eye. There is a unseen reality that is more real than the seen reality. What that prompts in the church is that we should be urgent in our praying. That when you read the scriptures and the apostle Paul and other New Testament writers are writing pray without ceasing, like they really mean it. It's not just petitioning God, but God ends up going out on our behalf and ends up clearing the way for the church, clearing the way for, the, for your family bringing healing to those who are hurting. Like our prayers actually matter. And in part, it's because we got a lot of enemies. 
Rick Ross used to say, I got enemies, got a lot of enemies. We got a ton of enemies. We got like 30 year olds and younger laughing in here. I'll explain it later. He's a rapper. In terms of spiritual warfare, the Apostle Paul, he would probably be befuddled, if that's a word I could use appropriately here, in our lack of praying and petitioning. He would probably see our lack, Roy's lack of prayer and petitioning against the dominion of darkness. He would see that as a soldier who goes out has no armor and has no gun. What good are you, Roy? There is a giant enemy. The question remains, how does the church then display outside of praying the wisdom of God to the demonic? See, the demonic have known God's wisdom since before the church began. They have, te- they have known the truth and then they have tempted Israel to end up sinning against God. But everything changed at Pentecost when the church was born. Everything changed. It was new to the demonic when they saw the Holy Spirit poured out on the church. And you ended up seeing that the church, like the dominion of darkness was very used to seeing Jewish people and humanity as unforgiving. And then they end up seeing this new creation, this third people group who were willing to forgive. They were very acquainted with the Jews or humanity who didn't care about salvation. But yet now they're seeing since Pentecost, the church is born, the spirit's poured out. The spirit is empowering the church to be on fire to go to every nation, every lost people group, and your lost neighbor and share the hope of Jesus. That is how we end up displaying the wisdom of God. In other words, how do we end up displaying the wisdom of God to the dominion of darkness? By living in the promises of God. Blood bought for you, born again Christian. You seeing them by faith. The angels on the angelic side, on the good guy side of light, here's what they're astounded by. That you are created in his image, which they are not. But number two is, you haven't seen, most of us have not seen God in the flesh, and yet we still believe. Astonishing. So every time that we resist the enemy's arrows, every time that we resist our old sin nature, every time that we lead someone to Christ, every time that you choose to enter in a time of prayer and fasting, every time that you and I pursue holiness and godliness, every time that we teach and train our children or the next generation, every time that we exercise a spiritual gift to give away, to to end up building someone up, every time that a person is healed, every time that you prophesy, every time you receive a word of knowledge, every time that you pray, every time that you end up helping others who can't help themselves, every time that you help with your hands by set up, tear down, whatever it may be, all of it is reminding the enemy of God's wisdom. And when someone's led to Jesus, they're reminded specifically that they have a future. Every born again person, they're like, here comes that future. They know the future, that they're going to be thrown into the fiery lake of damnation to be destroyed. And you and I and everyone in these seats who are born again, who are aware of that and bring people into Christ. Like that's a, that's a, depends on if you're filled with the spirit or, or like really in a bad place. It's a frightening thing or an amazing thing that we are with every person that we're leading to Christ is getting that much more closer in the end times of Jesus coming back. Historically, when the church has been persecuted in the Enlightenment period when truth was preserved, the Reformation when, when truth was reestablished, all of those have been amazing gifts of God where the dominion of darkness ended up looking on the church and seeing God's wisdom. The next question we would end up asking ourselves is why? Why? Why are we not just witnessing and intended to witness the lost folks? Why is Paul writing that we as a church would end up displaying God's wisdom to the demonic. I suggest, and it's a suggestion, this is Roy here speaking, that it's for God to show off to his former rebellion heavenly hosts that they were wrong. Every rebellion, two of them that happened, at least in scripture, the first at Eden happened with Satan tempting the Satan tempting humanity. The second one ends up happening at the Tower of Babel. Those two things happen. And when the church is established and God reconciles those who would believe in him, it was God's way of saying to the demonic, look at me now. Look at me now. We sing songs all the time about 
hey, the demonic, the principalities, the darkness, they thought they had won, they thought they had victory, and then boom, the resurrection of Christ happened. That was God basically putting his throat on the enemy being like, yeah, that happened. Your rebellion wasn't worth it on both sides of it. It's his way of saying, look at me now. And every person that's led to Jesus is that much more closer to this thing wrapping up for us to get the new heaven and the new earth. And this wasn't plan B. This wasn't plan B. Last portion here. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of Christ, our faith in him, we can now boldly and confidently enter into God's presence. We're new creatures because of Jesus. We're the third race because of Jesus. We can confidently approach God's throne because of Jesus. And I don't think that it's so wild of a thought that the Apostle Paul, after talking about the dominion of darkness and the rulers of the, and the unseen authorities of a region, ends up saying, now you can confidently go in prayer through Christ to God. I don't think that's an accident at all. There is no reason to be scared, church, of the unseen realities. I think an awareness is just like anything else. It's great for you to know. And it's great for us to be fueled into prayer, to go confidently to Christ. And for those who haven't yet bowed the, the knee to Jesus, haven't yet experienced new life, there's nothing like knowing the secret and living it out. There is nothing like being born again, experiencing his spirit, living with fruit that I've never experienced, and then actually being used in a way that's so satisfying. Let's be honest, everyone pursues happiness and pursues joy. And I think that's the way God wired it. It's just if you're going to find it in him or if you're going to find it elsewhere. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness and your kindness. Thank you for the depths of your scriptures. This being one sermon that ends up doing that, God. Help us understand what's at stake when we don't pray, God. We don't recognize what's going on. Help us be generous, too to those who we see and discern that are possibly being manipulated by the enemy, and to just pray for them, God. I thank you for all of the governing officials. God, I ask that you would use them, even if they don't know you, in ways to protect and preserve truth and righteousness in the land. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.